Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. First hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to spend time talking about what we're going to spend time on. <laughs> so for the next, we're looking out for the next quarter. We're brainstorming about how we're going to, you know, what subjects should we cover? Who do we want to invite? Specifically, we're talking about computer graphics. So things that the computers make. It can be 2D graphics. It can be 3D graphics. It can be game graphics. It can be broadcast graphics. It can be AR graphics. But these are all the subjects. So if you've got ideas of things that you want us to cover in the graphics area, then throw them in. We're not going to answer questions in the second hour. First hour, we're going to answer questions. So throw questions in for the first hour. Second hour, we're going to be brainstorming. So we're looking for, to the producers to think about you know, what would you like to see? What would be interesting for you? What uh, applications are you interested in? What processes are you interested in? What people are you interested in? So that's what we're looking for in the second hour. So if you've got ideas, go ahead and start throwing those in. And until then, let's go ahead and jump into the first question. Mitch, what do we have? Thank you, Alex. First in, Matthias Utia from Helsinki, Finland, returning to Apple ecosystem after 10 plus years when choosing a MacBook Pro laptop, what kind of difference do panels see between the M1 Pro and Mac 32 gig gigabyte versus the 64 gigabyte RAM for video editing and resolve? More is more, but how much better does it get after M1 Pro 32 gigabyte? Go ahead, Jesse. Uh, for me, RAM is really, really important. If you're planning to export anything that's an hour or longer, you really want that RAM, especially if you're working in 4 or 6K. I'll go ahead, Jason. The most important part of this is that Resolve will make full use of whatever you give it. And um, the second most important part is that it won't actually completely challenge the CPU unless you're plugged in. Both of those things, and I think you'll, you'll see that there is a significant difference specifically in Resolve. I'll go ahead, Bill. And Matthias, you didn't tell us what codex you were shooting in, but that's the one thing that's going to stress the system. If you're shooting uh, an odd codec uh, in the camera and it has to do a lot of back-end processing before you get something you can work with on your timeline, that's going to give you a little more taxing. But I would think all the modern machines should give you a very good experience. Resolve is the second fastest of the processors for video and Mac following Final Cut, which is Apple's native and optimized system. You shouldn't have any problems with either of those machines. And the marginal gains you'll get by upgrading, I would think, would be relatively minor, unless you're in one of those codecs that's very oddly interframe that needs a lot of processing before it can be worked with. Yeah, and, and what I would say is that I, I, if I had to choose between a 32 gig max or a 64 uh, gig pro, I would do the 32 gig max. Um, you know, I think that the chip, the chips and the and the ancillary um, things that come with that will get get you more performance. If you have to choose, I mean, I would love to have a 64 gig max, <laughs> but if you if you're choosing from a money perspective between those, I think the max is going to get you more performance from than the than the RAM, um, you know, because it's uh, 32 is a lot, you know, and it, it can actually do most frames that way and tell you, as Jesse said, if you're working with a lot of black magic 6k, and you're trying to edit, you know, four or five stream, you know, streams of that at one time, or channels of that at one time, you may want to have more RAM. Um, but I have a I think mine is actually, uh, I think my I, I think mine's 32. And it I'm doing six, the, what really is the thing that I'm doing six 6k uh, images with color correction, and it runs pretty smoothly. Um, and that's a studio, but it's, but it's, but the point is, is that it, it is probably about the same speed at this point. Um, and so I would, I would definitely think about that. Uh, next question. Next question in for Nick Bat in the UK. Anyone running Zoom ISO and AWS using their M1 machines, is it viable? I already have vMix set up and thought I might be able to just substitute NDI from ISO instance in place of vMix. And that's it. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, a few of us have tested it. The issue is really in the pricing and the the structure that Apple has set up with being able to use these machines. So, so on the PC side, we could rent these machines uh, by the hour, by the minute, and uh, the pricing is economical for a G4 DN 4X. What we're using, it's like a buck twenty. Uh, so on the Mac side, you have to rent it out for twenty four hours. So now, all of a sudden, if you just need to do a two hour show, you're paying thirty something bucks to to run that Mac. So the benefit of Zoom ISO on the Mac would be that you can go well prior to this latest build of uh, 
of uh, Zoom rooms, you couldn't use the, uh, you had to be, um, you couldn't use it in a breakout room, but now you can. So I would say the most affordable and effective way, the tried and true way that we're still doing is using Zoom rooms uh, in the cloud because it's just more economical. So that's the, that's the way we're, we're flowing. Yeah. And have you done the Zoom rooms in the, in the cloud yet the, with the four? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so the, um, cause I thought that the math, I thought that the math didn't quite add up. Like even if you were only doing a couple hours a day that, that the processor required to get four out of a zoom room with the new build was still didn't necessarily add up. But yeah, actually it's, it's three and then it's hit or miss on the fourth. That's because there's uh, there's a bandwidth limitation as far as uh, okay. My understanding was the hit or miss was whether what was the CPU and that you had to get a more expensive CPU to get that to work. Um, we we put it up to in our test with uh, Ronnie and I. We were going. We later learned that we were pushing it too hard, so we were trying okay. to get eight. So oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> we were under the impression that we could get eight, but it, you can absolutely get eight seven twenty p. So after I think it's three, you hit the fourth, and then that's your last 1080 and then you're dumbing down to 720 after that. But it, it, it requires more testing to figure out why that is. Right. So I, I mean, the infrastructure that we've built here having, you know, well, if you, oh, I'm talking about the office hours infrastructure, if, if you have uh, the means to, to just buy the, the stuff, put it in a sonnet box is probably more economical if you're doing this stuff all the time and you get 1080s right. all the way around. So no. there's pros and cons to both. Absolutely. No, no I'm, I'm just curious because it's, it's, it was, I think that I'd seen some math go by that was still like, I wasn't sure if I even going for, for the, the amount that you can get out of a Mac mini in the cloud. I wasn't, I wasn't certain that it, that it added up yet to, because you had to get a much beefier processor, um, from the, from the, for the zoom room to get all of what the zoom room can do, um, you know, to equal the Mac mini. That was the thing that I wasn't, wasn't sure of. Gotcha. But yeah, so so we'll uh, we'll see. More testing is required. But I think that uh, I do agree with you that Zoom rooms are. If you're going to do something in the cloud, Zoom rooms is probably the solution, not not ISO at the moment. Um, uh, next question is from uh, um, is from Mitch. <laughs> this, this <laughs> what the guy reading it. Yeah, yeah, Mitch, uh, Mitch. Next one is from Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. Are there any great online brainstorming tools that you've used or think you might try? Go ahead, David. So I'm a Google guy. I'm a big fan of Google, um, which is if you're if you want to use text as your primary way of brainstorming and sharing ideas, that's fantastic. If you're looking for something that's a little more visual, um, I would invite you to visit Canva. Canva back in uh, was it November, I think, launched a whole bunch of new functionality. One of those was whiteboards. And so if you go to your Canva account, you click on whiteboards up at the top they actually have a whole section of templates on brainstorming. And so if you click blank, you have a whole bunch of options over here on the left-hand side of templates that you can begin to build with. And what, what I really like about these is that once you choose one for these, just like most other whiteboards or infinite whiteboards, is that these are all just different elements from uh, the left-hand side. So just as you would build anything else in Canva, you can continue to bring things over and build this whiteboard out. And of course, you share it and collaborate with other people. So if you're looking for something visual, Canva may be a good option. I go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I didn't look at it as a, a means of recording your brainstorming. I looked at it as actually helping you with your brainstorming. And I think chat GPT is a, a perfect application of that. You can ask it for topics on any subject and it can give you a list or it can, you know, you ask it to elaborate on any topic. So you can find topics that you may not have thought of or, or ideas that you may not have thought of for a certain topic. So uh, try that out and you'll be surprised at what it comes up with. A lot of coders are using chat GPT to brainstorm. I, I actually put in, I want an, I write me an application that will lock my camera to 48 megapixels uh, in the Swift language. And it wrote me, I don't know if it works yet, I've tested, but it wrote me the code to do it. <laughs> like, and then I looked at it, I was like, oh, I didn't think of that. You know, you know, so it was, uh, so it was very interesting. Go ahead, Jason. Um, I didn't see this as, as primarily web-based, but um, for me, I, I've always used MindNode and it of course can publish to the web. Um, but I've been playing around with Freeform and they've, they've got a good start there. Uh, Freeform is an, on Mac OS and it, it allows collaboration. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jesse. That was the one I was going to suggest. I just got started with Freeform and it looks something like this. 
and it's nice. You can move things around. It feels. It, I don't know that it's completely justified that it's a separate app from the Note app that that is pretty much the exact same thing, but with text instead of images. It seems like they could have merged these two, but it's off to a good start, and it's uh, shareable in the same way that Notes are shareable in. Sorry about that. That notes are shareable in uh, uh, if if everyone is in the Apple ecosystem. Yeah, and the one that I've used the most is Miro, um, and uh, if I've spent a cumulative days or months <laughs> or weeks or months in, in Miro uh, designing apps and, and building those out, and it's been it's been a really good experience. Now, um, next question. Tom Ferguson in Phoenix, Arizona, right here on our panel. I need a recommendation for noise canceling headphones for my wife. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Uh, this is going to save a marriage. Uh, are you going to train it with your own voice so it knows what? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. My wife actually has to sit for dialysis three times a week, and that's a session of about three and a half to four hours. And there are a lot of people doing the same thing in the same area. And when you do this, you've got lots of beeps and buzzes, and when you've got a machine that acts up, beep, beep, beep. So she wants a sound cocoon of some sort, Uh she has not specified over the ears or in ears. She's very sensitive to external sound. I tried the ear plugs. Mm, she wasn't happy with this. I would also suggest a cone of silence, but I have to sleep here, guys. So help me out. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. So there's a couple of approaches just to think about. If she does a lot of traveling on airplanes, as we all know, that is a huge market for people who want to suppress the airplane noise and be able to enjoy music or something like that. The Bose Quiet Comforts have always been very highly regarded in that respect, but there are others now. If she has other kind of noise issues, and I think Tom just described a really excellent one, you may have to look a little closer because there aren't as many that suppress the noise without doing the common sample the noise then invert it and take it away from the signal and that always damages frequency response and the actual content you're listening to so it depends on whether she prizes quiet what kind of quiet and how she's willing to have the content degraded not for uh, music listening at a high level but that's kind of the field landscape you're looking at uh, now jump i should tom, tom i should ahead. also add, add uh she likes to watch her iPad, likes to watch movies. Mm -hmm. uh, so this needs to be a Bluetooth solution. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I was going to say that what Bill Davis was recommending, uh, the Quiet Comfort from Bose works great. Um, I think they are working on a Bluetooth version of it. I haven't, I haven't seen it lately, and I've got the older Mark II. But it's amazing how that kind of technology works because you place it over your head, and then when you switch it on, the plain jet engine goes away. So probably work the same way in a noisy uh, uh, electronics room. Harshin? I would recommend the Sony lines of the H1, WH-1000. Uh, currently, I'm wearing the Mark IVs. The Mark Vs are out. They offer a uh, comfortable wear because they're light in weight. I don't recall the exact uh, kilograms, but uh, out of all the new arrivals, they are the lightest. If you like sound, sound quality, the Momentum 4 are really a decent pair. Uh, they, the one thing you mentioned after the fact, though, was iPad. And if you're going to go through the iPad route, then I would go ahead and spend the money and get the, the cans that uh, AirPods can. I don't, I don't know what they're called. The AirPod, Max. Air, yeah. AirPod Max. Is because you'll get all the codecs. And you'll get the transparency. You'll get the measurable uh, noise canceling. So, you know, you could get rid of the machines and stuff, but still maybe have a conversation. Or if you want to flip it on the other side where you want to hear your surroundings uh, and still listen to your music, then you have that availability. So, uh Sony is really doing doing great with this. Their uh, call audio is also great for this particular XM5 model that they came out with. Uh, so it cancels out uh, a loud room or a, a noisy bar, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, so either one that you might go with would, would suit your needs, I think, If and somebody might have an in-ear solution as well. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I'm not sure how good they are at filtering out intermittent beeps, but I guess they can do it if your your sound source is something from the iPad. I, what I was thinking is if I thought your wife <clears throat> didn't really like to listen to anything at all, she was sensitive to sound, then uh, uh, white noise for masking the outdoor sounds, you just put a, a, good, P, a good pair of over-the-ear headphones and play back some uh, white noise at a comfortable level, and it masks all the leaking sound that leaks around the earpads uh, from it. Go ahead, Guy. 
Yeah, I'd say get a pair of these ones. These are the uh, AirPod Pro Max. I just got back from a trip on an airplane with a noisy baby nearby, and uh, there's a little button right here that is makes it, that makes the noisy babies go away. It's uh, <laughs> switches from transparency to noise canceling, and it's pretty amazing stuff. There's a noisy a baby it's, it's, button. It's, it actually has That's a little. Right it's inscribed next to it. It says NNB, noisy na no na noisy na baby. <laughs> just 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 push the little button there, and it's. So, yeah, and if you're listening to uh, spatial audio, the stuff in the Apple Music Store is pretty amazing. So I don't know if she'll really dig on that stuff, but with an Apple uh, iPad and watching movies, it's pretty amazing because even as you move your head around, it senses where you're at and it knows uh, how to change the direction. So I'd highly su suggest these. The quality is amazing. Yeah, the the um, I I use the AirPod uh, AirPod Pro Max, I think is what they the the um the the Apple ones, and they seem to work really well. I I actually when I go on flights, um, I've only been on a couple, but when I go on them, I put these head these eyepieces in. They have like little cavities in the front for your eyes, so it's not up against your eyes. And I put those on, and then I put the Max over top of that, and then I and then I actually put these over top of the the Max, so I can snugs it in. And I have a little neck thing, and then I just don't move for six hours. <laughs> like, I just, I'm just like in another world, and uh, they work really well. It so. doesn't really encourage conversation, does it? That's exactly the point. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, next, next, next question. Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida asked, how many 1080p, the 1080-30p Zoom ISO outputs is it feasible to run on a Mac Studio with Blackmagic intensity cards? Thanks. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, I don't think you mean intensity. If you're going to do this, it should be a deck link. The intensities, I believe, only have one, maybe two inputs or outputs at any given time. Um, the Duo 2s are the ones that we've had a lot of luck with, and the answer is but a lot. I, I'm not sure. Um, eight. Do, what's eight. the eight's a record, Alex? Wow. Uh, eight's, eight's yeah. right. Well, so we have done up to, um, I think we've done up to 16 from the studio, from my studio. I have a Studio Max, um, 32 gigs of RAM, I think, maybe 64. I have to look again. Um, but I, we have hooked two Sonnet boxes to the, um, uh, to the studio, and we have added uh, two quad a quad cart to each Sonnet box and been able to get 16 outputs from it. Um, I wouldn't probably run a production that way. Um, but it was a it was a full sixteen outputs from the studio. So um, and and that only is SDI. If you do NDI or 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 other or you know other things, you you won't get that that kind of the SDI because Zoom ISO is talking directly to the card. Like well, using Apple's um, tools, and so it's it's a it's a very efficient. You know, Siphon is a little bit less efficient, and NDI is a lot less efficient than um, the SDI output. So, but sixteen is what you can can get to on a on a production. But I would leave it at eight. Uh, next question. From Nathan Cashin in Oregon City, Oregon, one of our favorite home videos on VHS is now playing back as a blank, black screen. Is there a recovery service for VHS like for hard drives? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, it depends. It depends on the cause of the black screen. If it's uh, the cartridges, if the VHS cartridge is jammed, if you have a VHS player that you can look at the top of it and see if the reels are going around of when you're playing it. If they're not, then it's jammed and you might need to send it off to somebody to, who can take it apart and repair it if you're not up for that yourself. Uh, there are services like uh, Memory Box, I think, makes them. They digitize VHS. Uh, I, I'm not sure how well they diagnose or fix any jammed or uh, non-functioning VHS, but they will take your VHS tape slides or uh, even 8 millimeter film and digitize them and put them into uh, playable video files for you. That way you don't have to worry about it jamming anymore. Uh, sometimes you might look at it, flip the little thing up on the thing and uh, flip the little cover up on the tape, like pressing in the little button on the side and see if the uh, tape has gotten twisted and flipped wrong side out. So you want to make sure that it has the dull side uh, facing outward and not inward. And that could be the problem. If you untwist it, it might work for you. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, not much to add to what Courtney uh, gave you a very comprehensive answer there. It's very unusual that a VHS tape that wasn't uh, working correctly would show black um, unless the tape was broken or frozen, as Courtney suggested, or it could be something as simple as your uh, uh, outputs on the VHS machine just aren't putting video out. So check all those things to make sure before you go to an expensive recovery service. Go ahead, Bill. 
Some of the more expensive VHS machines also had a tracking control. You know, these are helical scanning heads that move very rapidly. And if they get off track, sometimes they will not read the tape and adjustment of that. I would think that the people who are still doing this professionally, like the service that was just indicated, would have those sophisticated machines and might be a better chance. Send them a single tape and see if they do a good job with it. And if so, send the rest. Go ahead, Chris. I don't know that I'd go so far as to call tracking sophisticated, Bill, but um, I, in the early part of my pre-career, I actually worked in a video rental store. I thought I was getting into television. I was horribly wrong. Um, uh, I've never seen ever, ever a tape playback completely blank and black if the signal path was proper. I suspect the tape at least possibly could be okay, but you have another problem. Go, Jesse. I haven't seen a tape playback entirely black, but I have seen some VCRs that will dump to black if the signal is too fuzzy. So you might want to try the tape in another VCR. Next question. Next question for David Brady in New York, New York. David asks, connecting two ATEMs off home via ATEMs encoder to ATEM streaming bridge at home. At the office, the source is still on, but the duration counter stopped at 2400. Exactly. Bug or limitation? Go ahead, Courtney. As a programmer of many time-oriented, time-code-oriented uh, programs, I'd say that's a bug. Somebody did the rollover and forgot to wrap around at 24. So I think it's a bug in the code. Yeah, Jason. Um, I'll offer a little bit of color because I'm pretty sure that Courtney's right. Night, port 1935, if you've got two ATEMs going to a um, to a streaming bridge, you it may be a config issue. Port 1935, I think it is, TCP. Um, can get a little bit wonky, especially if it's not sure which ATEM it's talking to. So I, I would I would just double check that. Next question. Next question from Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul asks, is there any way to relabel the names of the video and audio sources in the Zoom, quote, select a microphone, unquote, and, quote, select a camera, unquote, menus? I don't think there is. I think that they are what they're defined as. They have to be defined in the OS, and it's just looking at that OS list. We would have changed it a long time ago if we could, because uh, there's a lot of confusion that creates. If you create multiple, like, Brios or, uh, or other things, they'll all just show up as different, you know, the, we'd love to rename them. Um, but but I don't think there's any way to rename them right now. And I, I think that probably would take some work to get them to upgrade, because it, 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 it creates a lot of potential problems if you start doing that. Because what if you plug in... There's a lot of things. If you, there's a lot of what ifs if you start renaming them inside of that. It's it's easy when there's one or two things. It's harder when there's a lot of them and they and they get unplugged and replugged. It would it would not be a trivial problem to solve. Um, next question. Matthias Utila from Helsinki, Finland, asking follow up question about the Apple looking at a future proof iPhone with good camera plus lidar. Is there any other recommendations besides a 14 Pro and why? How about internal memory versus iCloud? Also, is there best time of year to buy Apple products, releases, sales, etc.? Go, ahead, Jason. I'll answer the last question first. If you go to um, Mac Rumors, they have an excellent cycle that will show you how far in the cycle the the product is and whether or not it makes sense to buy it. As far as future proofing. Apple is just going to continue. You know, they've they've got this beautiful triage of lenses plus um, plus lidar, and they're just going to keep pushing it. So I, I hate to say it, but it's a little optimistic to call it future proofing. As far as um, extra storage, get as much as you can afford because uh, you're going to use it. You got Bill. In the primary new phone market, there's really not much reason for them to lower prices or put things on sales. Occasionally, you'll see bundles and things like that that try to add additional things to bring the overall price down. But Apple is a retail company, mostly in terms of its phones. I would say um, future-proof, no. The point of an iPhone is that their research and their uh, improvement of them makes it a pretty compelling set of new features and new qualities you get every time you do your your rev and i usually skip one generation but if i go too much beyond one generation i find that i feel like i'm really losing functionality and worse than that it's getting to that deprecation stage where they're going to stop supporting it it's just going to be another piece of junk on my old drawer they make really good clocks <laughs> like little you put atomic clock there on there go. and yeah. they're the little clocks up to that all the all um, four generations back is a good point <laughs> i went to give one back like at an iphone 8 i was like i wonder what i can get for this online they were like 
Oh, uh, sorry. There's nothing we can do. <laughs> like, you know, I'm sure you can, you can take it to a, a, a it, it gave me some link to someone to recycle it. You know, it was not, not like you could do it. So I turned it into a clock. Um, the, uh, the big thing is with the pro is going to be the 48 megapixel image. So if you want to take 48 megapixel images and they are good 48 megapixel images, I'm doing a bunch of tests with them right now. So those are, that's the big reason to, 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 to use the pro over the other, other ones is the extra lens and the, and, and that and uh, the the 48 megapixel capability and if you're where that becomes really useful is things like photogrammetry so that I want to be able to shoot 48 megapixel images to, to build 3d models to get back to what we were talking about in the second hour um, and so so that's a useful thing you're three months into the cycle I don't even need to go to Mac break rumor <laughs> to Mac rumors you're, you're three months into the cycle there's nine months left before the next one um, Apple's pretty predictable about when they release their phones so um, it's not a bad time to go once you get to March or April I would probably wait if I could you know like if it's you know it's but you're gonna have to decide there's always gonna be a better phone I will say that the I feel like the progress of the phones is slowing just because what else are you going to add? <laughs> like it's just, it's, and so the cameras get better. Um, but those are the big things we see. The cameras get better. There might be a new little chip that does something special. But, but um, I think that, you know, my, my kids have, a, I had to test a bunch of cameras. And so I had a bunch of 12s or a couple 12s. So my kids got, ended up with those 12s and uh, th their experience is probably very similar to mine. <laughs> you know, most you know most of the time. So, so I, I think that there hasn't been a ton of forward progress. Um, it's mostly that it's a really good buy if you if you're three or four generations back. It looks great. Even skipping one year, I'm not sure how much uh, return you're getting. Go ahead, Bill. Well, the other thing is that we're all hearing, and I, I agree 100% with what Alex said through this whole thing. They're talking about these three nanometer fabs coming online. They're at four now, so that's a 25% increase in density that they may have when the next big cycle comes out. We don't know if that's going to be the next phone or the one after that. But when they get those three nanometer chips going, I think we're going to get a lot more power in the same package. So that's worth keeping an eye on. But that's probably months and months away. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. And as we say every year, we're hoping to get away from the lightning port because that's the real limitation of these devices at this point. Um, yeah. Hopefully next year, we'll see. Yeah, while I'm, while I'm not a big fan of the government legislating what connector we have on our phone, I think that's dumb. Um, but uh, I do think Apple needs to move to USB-C like, or Thunderbolt. Like give us, give us something that's going to connect there because the speed of getting Apple ProRes off the phone is pretty painful. Uh, next question. Tony Mobley, Duna, Georgia, asking, I'm having trouble bringing in music from an iPad to A10 Mini Pro with audio hijack and loopback sound. Goes in and out during the house of worship. Any suggestions? Go ahead, David. Not sure where you're bringing the audio into, but if you're bringing it into Zoom, I, I would check something as simple as, do you have original audio on? Because if you don't, then you're going to get cuts in and out oh. of your um, music. Yeah, it could be original audio. It also, if you're bringing music into a Zoom, you should be using the screen share solution, not coming in through the ATEM. So, or or, or coming through um, the the audio. Don't make the don't make it the audio source. You want to build that into your output. And and if you go into screen share and you go into advanced, um, you'll see computer audio. And in, in that computer audio, that is what you want to use to bring audio in because then it's not doing any echo, echo cancellation. It's not doing any process and just it just rolls that right in. So make sure that you're doing it that way and let us know. Go ahead, Jason. First thing I would do is just make sure that my signal pathway is right. The easy way to do that, I guess, would be to break the analog loop and then, you know, reintroduce it. But that, that, that's probably, if you don't have the hardware for that, it's probably overkill. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, Alex, you mentioned FL Studio as a popular DAW in EDM market. What can I do that others can't? What can it do? Uh, yeah, the, um, it's, it, you know, FL, you know, they, I thought that they, they've been trying to grow up, so they've changed it to FL but because before it was Fruity Loops, Fruity Loops Studio. And, and um, so uh, it is, uh, and David's laughing because he doesn't, he doesn't believe me, but it is. Fruity it's, Loops? It's, Fruity <laughs> Loops. That yes, I Fruity concur. Loops. Is yes. it Fruity Loops or Fruit Loops? But it's Fruity. one of the other. No, Fruity. Fruity. I think Fruit yeah, Loops, Loops is the cereal probably branded yeah. by so, so anyway, General so, Mills. So anyway, that's, the, so FL Studio is used by a lot of EDM. Uh, you know, and, and I didn't, the reason I know that it is is because I kept on seeing that interface popping up on a documentary years a couple of years ago, 
And I was like, what is that? I don't know that interface. And so I, I started searching that. I did a reverse search in Google to figure out what it was and then found, found FL Studio and, and jumped into it. I think that for running loops, for running sequences, for running, there's a lot of tools there that are just really built to do what you do in EDM. You know, it's obviously, you know, a lot of things get driven by the community that uses them because they make all the requests. And so it's very clear that a lot of very important EDM folks have made a lot of important requests to make that very fluid. Um, would I use it to edit a podcast? Probably not. Um, but if you're doing EDM, it has got all these little creature comforts of, of grouping things together and, and folding them and moving them around and all the things you'd want to do if you're building an EDM um, source material. And so I think that it's it, it's just it's just the culture that's used it. They've pushed it for years, and they've ended up with something that is is much more refined for their use. Go ahead, Jason. Fruity Loops is, and it will always be Fruity Loops to me. Uh, Fruity Loops is the most visual way to understand sequencing and drum machines, and you know the way that you subdivide sixteenth notes or eighth notes in order to understand, you know, how a timeline works. And um, you know, of course, four four with four bar phrasing is is all EDM. So um, you know, your 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 standard sixteen by is is very useful to 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 really understand that. And to me, it's the a really visual component that it does better than everybody else. Next question. Next question coming in from Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois. Kenny asks, I mistakenly closed the office hour server in Discord, thinking I was just logging out of Discord. I discovered there is no undo for this action. How do I again gain access to the office hours on Discord? I'm sorry, we can't. Yeah, if you, once you leave, you can't come back in. It's just the way it is. Uh, no. You can check out anytime you want. <laughs> I think there's an invite. Yeah, yeah you, you, can check, you can't check in. Yeah, the um, uh, the, the I think the link is going out in the email every morning. Um, so you should be able to you should be able to subscribe there. If not, uh, I was gonna say yeah, you can reach out to me in Discord if you're having trouble, uh, or 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 Brandon or or Josh. But uh, I was gonna say I I, I realize you're, you're you're still in Discord. You're just not in the server, so you could you could ping me. But uh, I think it should be you should look at the email that we send out every morning. Make sure that there should be a link there for you. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, what sort of patch panel would I need to break out the inputs of an Audient ASP800 preamp to the front of my rack? There's a link to it. We're going to take a look at that. Um, by the way, as a, as a quick um, uh, note to our producers, we've probably got some room. Uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of brainstorming questions coming up, but we have probably some room for more questions if you, if you have some. Um, the, uh, I don't know if any, I think we're all, I think that's a very vertical question here. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, I had trouble finding a picture of the back of this thing, and only when I opened the manual do you see that it, for output it has a, uh, it looks like an ADAT type connector, 25 pin uh, for its analog outputs, DB25. Uh, and on the inputs it's got XLR, so uh, for your inputs you could just get a rack that has, uh, you know, eight XLR, um, you know, females, uh, and... Uh, for the outputs, you're going to have to get an ADAT adapter or break out or wire your own cable that goes from that 25 pin to XLRs if you want them, those on the front. And of course, there's toss link, so you'd have to deal with that and find some uh, uh, type of rack mount toss link connector. Uh, and Winstead, I'm not sure many of the rack manufacturers will have versatile racks that can accept the same form factor for different types of connectors. It'll take Neutrik, uh, male and female XLRs, and uh, as well as Ethernet and so on. but So maybe you can find some. Uh, you may have to do some soldering, though, if you can't find a breakout cable for an ADAT. Go ahead, Jason. Um, so before you even get into the patch panel, I, I will remind everyone of these, you know, what are they? There are two standards, right? One is Tascam and the other one is somebody else, and it gives you, you know, some sort of parallel port with all these balanced output connectors. Um, a patch panel, an analog patch panel, to me, in this day and age, uh, unless you're doing an analog synth, is is a terrible idea. Um, yeah, that it's just it feels feels strange. I go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Yeah, I kind of with Jason on that. I would think more of a router that uh, routes all those various types of services, whether it's Toslink or AES or analog. Uh, there is a company called Zsyst, Zulu Sys. 
that makes a 16 by 16 router that will take any and all of those types of inputs and outputs and route them around your uh, system. So instead of patching on the front, uh, you would patch on the back because all the devices in your rack could be plugged into this uh, uh, ZSYS router and then you could route them where you need to go. Good, Chris. I'd like to point out that when Jason held up that sample, it was still wrapped as though he just brought it home from I Guitar Center. I never used it. <laughs> Show the cardboard. <laughs> like it's hanging on the pin at Guitar Center. Is that a Hosa? Uh, probably. Yeah, sure is. There you go. <laughs> go ahead, Guy. Yeah, looking at it uh, from the picture that I could see, one of these Hosas would probably do the trick. This is a PDR 369 12-point XLR balance patch bay. Looks like on the back of the Audient, uh, it's got uh, the XLR in, so there's eight XLR ins, and then the HOSA has uh, eight on the front and then the eight on the back. So 103 bucks at Sweetwater. I think that'll get you there. I'll put the link in the chat. Next question. Next one in from Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul asking, Brian Shan likes Overcast. I like Pocket Cast and CastBox. What do you like for a pod catcher, pod player, pod searcher? Is there such a thing as a decent player or producer all rolled into one? Go ahead, Jason. No. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, uh, Chris. You know, this is one of those things, Paul, that uh, I, I get the the podcast 2.0 uh, uh, movement um, in the morning. Uh, I, I am perfectly fine, and I listen to a couple of podcasts all the time. Uh, I'm perfectly fine just using the built-in one in uh, in iTunes. I know it doesn't have all the new features. I know it doesn't play chapter uh, or album art, um, which is cool. And there are some great new features in the podcast 2.0 catchers. Um, what are those great new features other than playing it back? Well, so <laughs> it, it's I'm a whole... I'm with you. I'm just, like, just kind of like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean... It, it's it's fascinating what has been done. I know that uh, we had a guest on, Mr. Laporte, who thought the 2.0 movement was stupid, or what did he say? Uh, it, it it was nearly uh, slanderous uh, what he said about Adam Curry. But what they've done is they've added the ability to while you're listening to a podcast you can there's a button you can hit and you go ooh i like this and you can actually share um bitcoin with that show like oh i like what you're doing mm -hmm. you know instead of just putting up little stars or something you can actually be paying somebody um the album art has the ability to change with every episode which very 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 few shows actually take advantage of um, you can also, if you're listening to something, you can change album art in the middle of a show. So you could put up, you know, like chapter headers and stuff like that. There's all kinds of things where it does live transcription, all in the podcast 2.0 uh, player. So th there's some neat stuff, but I'll tell you, I just use the one that's built into the phone. My, my iPhone. Yeah, Courtney. I might look at Winamp. I use that on my phone. Uh, it's very handy. I think it does podcast management as well, does streaming and organizes your music library and gives you all the controls uh, for uh, adjusting, you know, all the parameters of your musical or a podcast playback. So look into Winamp. It's been around forever. I was, say, I was like, and I haven't it heard that. Kicks the llama's that rear end for a long time. <laughs> it really <laughs> kicks the llama's. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, uh, uh, the what was I going to say? The um, I think Overcast is great. I use the regular podcast one. I think that um, uh, I, I don't install something new. It keeps track of what I'm doing. It keeps track of it between devices. It keeps track of where I am between devices. Those are the things that are important to me. Um, and I think that Apple is focusing a lot on podcasts right now. And I think that it could get difficult. If you're using a, an external player to keep up with the features that Apple starts adding to the podcast app, because it'll have more interactivity, it'll have a lot more other things that I think are probably going to happen um, in the in the not too distant future. So I, be I'd be super interested if they are watching the 2.0. There's there's dozens and dozens of 2.0 players, and they're way ahead of what Apple is. 
it's not currently giving us publicly. I don't know what they're right. doing behind the scenes. The main thing is, is that uh, I think that I, I do think that Apple's paying attention to the subscription service model and how do you add features to that model and how do you add reasons to to give a podcaster some money every month and. And with that comes usually how do you add those features and, and that interaction between the player and the subsystem can be difficult to do with a third party as well as Apple can do it. And that's, I mean, traditionally Apple can do it better than they can because they, they own the whole system. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens over the next year. Now, next question. From Richard Lavery and Belfast, I'm replacing a Drobo, which we use for footage backup, suggestions on what we should move over our data storage to. Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, it seems that Drobo's got problems, and uh, I think people that have them have been receiving letters from them. I don't know if they're completely defunct, but uh, they're certainly on standby. Um, I'm seeing everybody going with Synology. It just seems to be the uh, uh, the de facto choice that most of us are making here. There you go, Jason. More specifically, I've been very happy with the Synology DS1522+. Plus because it has this nice little 10 gigabit ethernet addition. You don't need to buy that straight away, but it will go beautifully into a, a 10 gigabit switch. Yeah, there are a few little tweaks you have to make, but oh boy, is it quick. I go ahead, Tom. Yes, I have a pair of those 1522 pluses. And even if you don't buy that 10 gig port right up front, it does come with four one gig ports. It screams, it really does. It's great. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael with a question. With all the talk about attracting young people to tech, why haven't we heard of immersive learning experiences in the U.S. and Canadian K-12 through system like these? And there's a link to it. Uh, go ahead, David. Because with few exceptions, our educational system in America is completely broken. And, and we have no interest in nurturing creativity, in nurturing, um, in teaching children how to fail, how to fail fast and then get right back up, how to try different things. Um, and, and the idea of creating an immersive experience, I think is in many ways antithetical to the goals, the current goals of our education system, which is teach children how to put this into this so that they can work on the assembly line. It's astonishing that that's still our goal, but that really is where we're stuck. Yeah, I don't think that the, I don't think innovation is going to come from within <laughs> at, at the education system in the United States, you know, so um, we're, you know, COVID broke something opened and we talk about this a little bit on Saturdays, but COVID broke something open where people started to, I think one of the big problems was that a lot of people saw what was being taught and that created a lot of, um, you know, the, the, the level of, of education and, and, and so everything else before people were saying, I'm a parent, my kids are in school right now. And before, you, you know, you sent your kids to, to a, the place and they got educated and they came back from the place. When it was in their house, people got to overhear all the classes and it made them a little crazy. And, um, and so uh, uh, there's probably, you know, within the next five years, probably 30% of the population, 30% of the parents will pull their kids out of, out of public school. And it can only afford to manage about 15 to 20% loss before it, it um, in, implodes. So, so it is... Uh, um, we're probably not, we're going to probably see a restructuring of the public school system in the next 10 years because, uh, and I don't even know, I think it's going to just end up going to vouchers where kids just get, this is how much is, this person has this much budget to do this thing because I don't think that it can survive. Um, I don't think that, I, I think that, I don't, I don't think it's anybody's fault. Like I don't, I, I, don't, I don't think there's a conspiracy. <laughs> like I don't think it's anybody's fault. I think it's just, it's, it's a massive operation. It's a $600 billion a year operation that just moves at a certain pace and it can't move as fast as what parents want now. And I think they're not going to be able to make the turn. Uh, go ahead, Bill. As someone married to an educational specialist, I would say it goes farther back than that. Linda had so many struggles. She desperately wanted to be a teacher because she does love teaching kids. And she found the system completely untenable starting about 15 years ago, and it has not improved much since then. Yeah. It is scary how bad some of it is. And um, I don't know what's going to replace it because it's going to be really hard. There is so much politics. There's so much well, I, money. There is so much uh, I, I, and I think anger. That the, the, I, 
the irony is, is that part of what the problem is, is that it's doing too much. It's trying to have school do too many things rather than, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> you know, like it just, it doesn't do those very well. It needs to master those and then allow the students to evolve the way they want to evolve. And we'll just um, say that and, somebody needs to talk to the people inside of it, not at the top uh, levels, but in the middle levels I to see the experience that they're going through as teachers. Yeah, it's I don't think, frightening. I don't, I don't think anybody on the inside can make any difference. Go ahead, uh, David. I really think the fundamental problem is that, and it's ironic that uh, and institutions that are created presumably to teach children how to imagine and create and build themselves have lost the capacity to imagine, create and build. Well, but that's um, not what they're, that's not what they're, that's not what they're designed. That's not what they're out there to-, to No, uh, agree. No, that's why I said, it, 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 maybe it's wishful thinking. I, I think you're absolutely right about that. Look, I, as an educator, I tell every parent that walks into my school, if they're looking at our school, I say to them, your child, is, uh, this is little kids here. I said, your child's gonna learn their letters. They're gonna learn their numbers. They're gonna learn their colors. And I don't care about any of that. That's not my goal. I said, I care about two things. I want your child to know that they're safe. I want your child to know that they're loved. Because right. when children feel safe and feel loved, we educators can get out of the way and allow them to fly. Yeah, and so I think that it's gonna be, it's gonna be a really interesting um, couple of years <laughs> that, that we watch um, this, this process. And again, as a parent, you know, my, my kids fortunately are doing pretty well in what they're doing, but, but, it's, um, but I think part of it is, is that, you know, no child left behind left a big, uh, you know, like the the idea that that we're going to no child left untested is really what what that meant, and those tests then drive uh, school scores, and they're not trying to be creative; they're just trying to make sure they get good school scores because people like my wife pick the house that we live in based on those scores. You know, like like literally, they look at whatever that score is, and if it's a nine out of ten, or eight out of ten, or six out of ten, if it's six out of ten, there was no chance that we were going to move there. <laughs> like you know, like it was you know. So that's and that that and that's how the taxes get generated. There's just a lot. It's a really comp. It's it's a hard problem, and it's a problem that I, it's not that I, again. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not saying that there's anybody doing anything wrong. It's just a really really hard problem that is now unwrapping very fast, and so it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Uh, next question. David Paskin in Miami Beach, Florida, right here in our panel. I'm now on my third Stream Deck pedal that has lost connection with the computer. Elgato just keeps replacing them, and I keep breaking them. Guy, as a fellow pedal user, have you had any issues? Go ahead, Jason. Uh, well, Guy should, should be first, uh, but no, no issues for me. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I'm looking at mine right here, and it still seems to... That was mute. Uh, the connector right there does seem a little fragile, though. I don't know if you're kicking it or if it's just getting bent. It, it doesn't look like uh, it's a, a safe place for it. They should have built it so it's inserted, you know, like hidden or something. Is that the problem? Is the port getting uh, damaged by kicking it? I, I don't. Go, I I never touch the port, so I don't think so. It 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 just the computer can't see it anymore, and it's happened three times now. I I just and what don't fixes it? it? They send me a new one. Oh, and it and it, and it works. <laughs> for two months and then it loses connection. Are you, is, and it, then going into a, is it going into a hub? So I, I know that they recommend against that. I do have it going into a hub, but I, I test it going directly in and uh, that doesn't work either. I'm using the cable they sent. I'm going directly in. What hub know, are you using? I've got a CalDigit and an OWC. So I've tried in both. Was the it, when it, when it failed, which one was it plugged into? The CalDigit TS3. Yeah. I have a lot of trouble with cow digits, <laughs> so so really? I will say that yeah, I would, I would, uh, I've I've had quite a few issues, a variety of issues with cow digit hubs, and so I I won't use them. Um, the the if you get the new one, I would either plug it directly into the computer or plug it into the OWC, uh, and never plug it into the cow digit and see what happens. You know, as a, as a test, um, I bet you if you plug it directly in, it'll never go bad. And I bet it, you if you plug it into the OWC, there's a 90% chance it'll never go bad. And I bet you that if you plug it into the uh, Cal digit, it'll go bad 50-50. Is it possible that that a, a, a hub like, or dock, whatever this is called? As a voltage problem, yeah. Well, and, and that, that actually is, is yeah. ruining the, yeah. wow. That's, that's why I, I would stay away from the Cal digit. Wow, okay. Yeah. Uh, next question. From Greg Gibson in Washington, D.C., asking, a friend of mine wants to produce some cycling workout videos. She doesn't want them publicly accessible and may want a paywall. What platform would you recommend? Bill. 
I'd have her take a look at Vimeo Pro. I think it's got most of those functions now. It definitely has a private, if you post things not publicly, you can password protect some. And I think they have been working towards putting a monetization back end oh, yeah. on that that might take care of the other side of it. So that's where I'd look first. The only one I know of that does that. Vimeo has figured this out. <laughs> like, like that this is, they've, this is they, they can also, if she decides she wants to do something a little bit more, she they can they'll wrap an app for you and put it on the app store that people can subscribe to and pay for, and you can have live inserts and VOD and all kinds of other things. Um, Vimeo really solved this problem effectively. Um, so I would I, I I don't think that there's any close second to what they're doing right now. Uh, next question. Mike Muddy Schlegel in Raleigh, North Carolina, asking, I recently bought a used Behringer X32 so I, connect, can, uh, so I can connect multiple Zoom meetings together with individual Mix Minus audio, and I just got a Dante card for it. Would you create Mix Minus feed via Dante only or via the X32 bust sends? Thanks. I'll go ahead, Jason. I would use the X32 bus sends and then output them to Dante. I would I would patch it accordingly. So um, it's not either or, it's both. I'm trying to figure out all the things that you're doing there. But yeah, I would do the same thing. No, next question. Ian Alford in London, England. What software can help me discover the IP address of a device? I have no idea of its IP or even the subnet. I'm on a Mac. Go, Jason. Other than the handy dandy terminal, um, which is your best friend in this case, if you want a, a quick and pretty way to do it on, um, like in in the GUI, uh, try Netler. Yeah, and I've I've uh, uh, yeah, it, some routers also will tell you what's attached to them and what IPs they've given or what IPs are available. If it's manually addressed, it won't be there. But if it's DHCP, it'll know what it's giving it. But if it's set to a manual address, you really need to find out what that device usually, if it only has a manual device, if it's only manual, it usually has some kind of admin interface somewhere to get to that. But if it's a manual setting, I don't think you can find it externally. I think it has to see see what it's there unless you're just pinging everything to, to find it there. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, on the Mac, I use one called LandScan. On the uh, PC, I use Angry Angry IP, and then on my iPhone, there's a paid one. Net uh, Net Analyzer is the uh, the one for iOS. So between those three, you should be able to pull. And it it depends on how it's all routed in the routed table to routing table. Uh, otherwise, right. the best bet is to go if you have access to the router itself to to dig in there. So like on my Unify, I could see everything for sure. But but can you uh, see the ones I'm, that have their own manual addresses that weren't handed by the router to them? Yeah. And they're, if, if and they're in a in a different subnet. You can still um, see I don't know if it, it depends on the app, but yeah, maybe that's the difference between the paid one on the iOS because there's Net Analyzer free and then there's one that's like $9.99 and then LandScan. It seems like uh, thing. So like, for instance, Panasonic has uh, this thing uh, where you use easy IP to locate their devices. And so some of that stuff I don't see on nothing until uh, I use their app. So it, I guess it does depend on how how it's appearing and whether uh, and I it think wants to you, be shown in the if table. you want just a piece of hardware, I think a link runner might be able to do it as well, where you can just plug it straight into it and it'll talk to it and figure things out. Um, I know that I, I've plugged link runners into places I probably shouldn't have, and it just tells you everything all the way all the way to the internet. Like here's I went through this router and then I went through this router and then I went through this router. And if you do it at certain places, people come and talk to you. They're nice, but not happy. Right, go ahead, Tom. I use IP scanner and that will find anything. Uh I, I even discover things on other subnets other than the master subnet that I'm using on the network. Good, good. I knew that if we stalled long enough, John, then Tom would uh, raise his hand. <laughs> good, Jason. <laughs> now, the last part of this is that if the router is set up con correctly, it will not permit any, you know, any subnet outside of um, outside of that octet that it's in, or even more so. It just depends on the way that you have um, you have your subnet set up. Next question. Chris Widener from Lafayette, Indiana, asking, Teradek is sundowning their software AirMix. What would be a good alternative for Teradek hardware users? I would love to say that I don't know what even AirMix is. <laughs> so, so I don't know. I haven't used it. I've used a lot of Teradek devices, and I have not used AirMix. And so does, has anyone on the panel used AirMix? I think that's why they're probably doing a sunsetting is because none of us were actually using what they were making. Um, so I, I, I'm not even sure what the, what the feature set is there. So we'll have to come back to that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll do some research. Uh, next question. 
David Brady, New York, New York, asking, how do you size up Pelican-like cases? I've got a Mackie 1642 VLZ3 that I need to ship approximately 7 by 17 by 6 at 20 pounds. Go ahead, Jesse. Uh, we take our gear to uh, Field Tools in Burbank. If you're in New York, you could go to BH Photo, and I imagine they would let you look at their selection of Pelican cases. If you can't take it to the to the store to, to look at the actual models, uh, we assume one inch of foam around the perimeter, and then as much foam as you can afford um, with all the gear that you need to put in it. Uh, if this is a one and done ship, you could probably get away with, uh, with without getting the next size up, but we always get the next size up because we know that there's going to be more gear introduced with the kit as we continue to use it. And if you're going to be using this kit for a long time, uh, consider using Flex Seal to, uh, to make permanent the foam punch outs that you do. Flex Seal, that's a new one for me. So yeah, what's a, Flex Seal? Yeah, can you explain that a little bit? Uh, it's it's a uh, liquid rubber. You paint it on. You go outside and you put on one or two masks and you paint it on. You let it dry overnight and then we do a second coat, and that has helped our uh, pluck and pull foam uh, last for years instead of weeks. Looking at the mixer, I'm going to guess that you need a sixteen twenty. And you know you're a pelican geek when you could look at something. You look at the picture and you go, oh, that'll fit in a 1620. <laughs> so, so, so I think that that's a 1620, I think, is the one you want to look at. I might think about a 1650 so that if you had any ancillary stuff. But the problem is you start adding up a lot of weight. But check out the 16, the pelican case 1620. I think just looking at the mixer that it'll, that it'll, it looks like it'll fit in there. But, but let us know. Go ahead, Courtney. I'm not sure if it's the same one. I used to have a, a Mackie uh, 1604, uh, and SKB made a special rack for it that has a tilt-up. So it was a, a uh, an ABS-type case, not a Pelican-type case. But you mount the, uh, the mixer in there, and you open it up, and it tilts up. It has a bracket that tilts it up to a working level, and you leave it in the case. And it was very handy. So you might check out SKB or Gator um, Either one of them may have one specifically for that type of mixer. Uh, next question. Next question in from Douglas Carmichael. We talk about Yamaha consoles and backline as the utilitarian workhorse of our industry. Why do you think that is? Good, Mitchell. Yamaha's reliable, it's inexpensive, and they're plentiful. You know, I think that they, for a lot of, they, 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 they fit into a market in the middle you know, so I think that when I think about where all these mixers sit, there's a lot of different mixing consoles out there, of course, but there are ones that you see often, you know, you see a lot. And so what we see a lot of is in the low end, the sub $5,000 range, see a lot of Behringer, like just Behringer kind of owns that market um, in the sub $5,000 range. In the five to I would say twenty five thirty thousand dollar range, we just see Yamaha everywhere. You know, so QL ones, QL five, CL five. You know, those are the those are the ones we see mostly. They have um, they have more inputs than the than the X thirty twos. They have more processing than the X thirty twos. They have or the wings. Um, they have and they just kind of fit that market really well. Um, there's a there's a couple larger ones that they have there as well, but I don't see them as often. Um, and then. The next step up, what we see are Digicos and Calrex. You know, so that's so when they go over, when someone goes past uh, the Yamahas, the, what we norm, what we see the most. And I'm not saying that these are the best mixers. I'm just saying these are the ones that are the most common, the easiest ones to find an operator for. Um, are Digicos and Calrex are what we what we see, and they're all, which are both owned by the same company. So so um, so uh, it's a it's an interesting mix there. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, did I skip you, Mitchell? Keep or What's that? that? No, I'm just going to say yeah. Digico and Midas are the same company. Uh, no, Midas and Behringer are the same company. <laughs> so Behringer bought Midas a while ago. They yeah, keep ahead, doing Chris. this. Yeah, so Chris. I was going to say the other thing is that you have to keep it in mind that Yamaha has been in this game at the pro level like this for decades, decades. Uh, I know a guy who, you know, 40 years ago was, I guess 30 plus years ago, was, you know, the premier... Uh, high-end con console uh, renter or leaser on the West Coast, like the guy. I think he owned 15 or 20 of the Yamaha uh, PM4Ks, which was like the, right. the desk of the 80s. Um, uh, they've been doing it a long time, so they understand the market, they understand what people need, and they have a proven track record for delivering what they need. Yeah, good, Jason. 
Yeah, ever since the O1V was the first digital mixer I ever used, uh, I feel like audio snobs don't don't uh, don't turn their nose up at it, and professionals know how to use it. And that combination is exactly what you need. Oh, I hated my O1V. I, 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 that's the oh, first, I hated that's it. The first I'm digital that mixer. was the first digital. Yeah, that was the first digital mixer, and I just it was it made me so sad so often. Um, uh, but but the the QL1 we we've had a lot of QL1s and a couple QL5s and and uh, it's they they're just incredible as far as what the, the amount of IO and what you get for what you pay for. Um, next question. And Douglas is back with a question. If we wanted to find a physical space to say, put up a large audio video lighting system and experiment, where would that be? 3210 studios? That's the hope. <laughs> that, that, that's the dream for 2023. So we'll see how that, we'll see how that goes. All right. We are now changing subjects and we are brainstorming it's the beginning of the year. And we're going to do this about once a quarter. Um, so we're basically going to take a week and just kind of look at what we've done in the last quarter and then decide what we want to do on the next quarter. Um, you know, when we, it's, it's, it's evolving. You know, the first year that we did this, we, um, it was mostly like, good job, Wesley, we might kill you tomorrow. Like we didn't know how long the show was going to go. And um, the second year we we're like, oh, maybe we can start planning. Now we're really starting to get into structure. So, so again, uh, expect about once a quarter, we'll kind of stop and, and see what people liked from what we did in the past and what they want to see more of. Um, so the questions right now, um, as you as you think about these questions, think about, no, we're not going to answer your questions that you're asking in this second hour. We're going to talk about what those questions point towards um, as, uh, and if, if panelists want to talk about anything before we get into the questions, just raise your hand right now in the general discussion, but talk about what what you'd like to see um, and, uh, and, what, and what subjects we might be able to cover that serve the producers. Go ahead, Mitchell. As one of the lone uh, After Effects users here on the group, um, I'd love to see us do something like that, but more specifically, plugins. We don't cover plugins a lot, so maybe that would be an interesting uh, area to, to, to go off on. Yeah, yeah, no, I think we can, and I think um, uh, maybe we get some folks from Red Giant on um, uh, to talk about some of the stuff. I, I think the person that I that I enjoy a lot is uh, Stu, Stu Mashwitz, is my old office mate from ILM, and and uh, he's great because he'll show you the plugins, but he shows you an After Effects, and he takes you through a shot. Like here's the shot we had, and here's what I shot with my with my phone. Well, a lot of times it was like I went out with my phone and shot this thing, and then I created this great effect with it. So yeah, Red Red Giant now is owned by Maxon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the um, uh, so, anyways, but Stu, uh, I, I think might be someone we could bring on. That'd be a lot of fun. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the uh, into the first uh, discussion. First question. Sure. sure. Or, first first uh, comment, uh, topic, suggestion. Eric Billings from Washington D.C. Would a lidar maker project be worthwhile or too deep? For example, a thirty dollar kit from Amazon glued to a MagSafe mount and connected to the phone via USB. Writing the app would be instructive, fun, but would we need an experienced LiDAR user for guidance? Uh, go ahead, Courtney. It might be pretty interesting, but it's kind of vertically oriented because it's uh, expensive hardware. you got to have an iPhone 14 or, or in that neighborhood to participate. And unlike their Raspberry Pi building where, you know, $35 entry level. Uh, but for the people that already own those phones, it would be interesting. But it would be a pretty small, maybe a small subset of uh our viewers out there. So I, I, I don't know if it would be appropriate for a full hour. I think I don't think it's using the phone. I think it's using the LiDAR, like making LiDAR from like a little LiDAR kit. You know, these flash kits are less expensive now, these little little li flash LiDAR. Because um, I think he's talking about a $30 kit from Amazon that is the LiDAR, <laughs> you know, so. Um, oh, okay. I thought yeah, it was so, some kind of interface to your phone. Yeah, so I, I think it'd be a lot of fun. I think that probably would fit into a lab. Um, I think that, you know, where I'm, trying to think about content as we move through 2023 is eventually not immediately but eventually getting to a point where we where we say this is happening next week and here's a little video overview of what's going to happen and what we're going to talk about and subjects you might want to know and here's some links to things that you could research for that hour then you have an hour talking about you know with someone answering questions or us discussing it then if that goes well we have a lab that is you know something that we dig into a little bit deeper and then potentially we might even have a classes that we that we do that are a little bit more intense that you know okay i we've done the lab if we've watched the thing we've done the lab and there's a handful of people that really want to spend the next 10 weeks working on something in after hours or something like that so i think that those are the kind of that's kind of the the model that we're looking towards of of these um you know down the road not for every second hour but for some of them and i think this this might fit into that 
into that model. I, I do want to have things that we're doing more and more projects as a group. Um, I think that's important. Uh, next question. Bob Sturdivant is in from San Antonio, Texas, asking best and worst practices for adding graphics, showing examples of why certain graphics are bad or good. When is too many, many graphics? <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. Well, I think this brings up the whole idea of art direction and other areas that we don't explore very often here. And, and just in terms of some of these experts in verticals that are useful for the rest of us. I know I didn't know a lot about arranging graphics on a page until I started working in conjunction with art directors. And what they brought to the table amazed me. They just have a different way of looking at things. And they're useful in type. They're useful in graphics. They're useful in page design and raster design for video. And I didn't know what they really did. So I'd be think it'd be interesting to talk to some people in some of those uh, uh, Oh, the, the areas orbiting around our core subjects. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. I have a theory. Everybody wants to be an art director. If you've ever been on After Hours when somebody brings a uh, graphic and starts asking opinion, it's amazing to see how all that input comes in to, uh, and changes things as it goes. So perhaps a ruthless review of graphics in general or an example uh, would be an interesting uh, subject. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I think it would be an interesting topic because there's a lot of uh, detailed information that graphics, especially if you're going to get into broadcast uh, color space and uh, thing do's and don'ts about patterns and graphics for moray and compression, those kind of problems that you're going to get into for streaming and for compression and for broadcast uh, might be interesting. And it's something a lot of just graphics creation programs really don't touch on at all uh, about the appropriateness of the finished graphic to publication. Yeah. And go ahead, Chris. There's a really great discussion to be had around uh, workflow and how to build your graphics packages in a way that they are uh, functional and can be worked with um, flexibly, but also quickly. And I think, uh, I think that a lot of times we back ourselves into corners where we work much harder uh, on the tail end because we didn't work a little bit harder on the front end to make the tail end and all the subsequent changes that are likely to happen go smoothly. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that's important is logistics. You know, uh, folks can think of great graphics, but can you do them over and over again? And can you do them live? And can you do them? You know, there's a lot of things that exactly. it cut, yeah, cuts a lot of the cut, you cut off a lot of the edges. I do think that, you know, we had um, Alex Goldner on uh, years, you know, years ago on a second hour or a Saturday afternoon talking about how what he does. I think it'd be a lot of fun to bring him on again just for an hour just to talk a little bit about his process because I think that it's a really interesting when it comes to efficiency because he's taking oftentimes after effects comps and then putting them into motion and then and then just um, delivering them to Final Cut where the editor doesn't have to think about anything other than just the text they have to type in, you know, and the timing of when it shows up and um, which is a pretty, uh, pretty good pipeline. Yeah, yeah, Chris. It also would be super interesting to do something with uh, I would say probably Alex would be great in the in the final cut realm. Perhaps somebody like Mitchell representing Premiere and After Effects. And I don't know enough about the graphic stuff in the Resolve space, but it would be interesting to throw <clears throat> problems at each of them and say, "How would you solve this yeah. in your in your world?" Yeah, we've done that. We did a little bit of that in Pixelcore where we had it. Well, we, we called it Rosetta Stoning, which is that we would have three people do the same, exactly the same thing in three different apps. And in, in our case, I think it was uh, Maya and um, Cinema 4D, and I can't remember what the other app was, but we would do three, do the same thing in those three apps, and and then it would come out the other end, and we and the, and the you'd see what the different processes were and and how long it took, and and so on and so forth. Go ahead, Bill. And it's and it's not so much to make one person like the winner or anything, but it's, I think that you that you you can glean little bits of yeah. strategy from each one. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and learn how, and yeah, you have someone who really knows it and they're working inside of its strengths. It's not, yeah, not comparing which one is better, but just comparing, oh, this is how you do that thing in this app, you know, is, is interesting. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Chris's comment triggered me into thinking about the utility of brand books and things like that, which is really something that most large companies have that determine how you use their graphics. I mean, if you're going to do a bug in a corner, which corner does it go into and is it consistent? And the high level people that I've 
had the fortune to work with are always thinking about how do we use these graphics consistently when right. we're creating our screens. And it would be interesting to talk to somebody who understands brand book creation and how it functions. Absolutely, Mitchell. Chris is bringing all kinds of uh, inspiration here. Thank you, Chris. Uh, one area might be interesting is workflow. Um, whether it's a uh, Apple workflow or an Adobe workflow, because of the ability now of using an editing system and without having to round trip outside of the program, a lot of this stuff is now being brought inside the program so that you don't have to go too far to make a graphic change or make an audio change. It's all inside that edit uh, system. Yep. Uh, next question. Sky Gleason in Seattle, Washington. Uh, Canva, Midjourney, and other AIs are some of the new low-cost tools. What kind of office hour, second hour, can we help us embrace these new tools for graphics needs rather than being threatened by the new world of AI? Go ahead, Mitchell. I don't feel threatened by it. Um, I feel that it provides inspiration. And um, I think that certainly should be explored as how does Midjourney inspire you to do other things? So if you're doing previs, for example, we were talking about it yesterday, that uh, Midjourney may not be appropriate for the actual uh, final work because the director may you know, nitpick some certain things, but it also might provide a way of helping you get to what the director wants by adding it to your arsenal. Mm -hmm. So uh, I see that as a good thing. Yeah, no, I think that, I think that we can, I mean, Again, thinking about the subject matters of what we're what we might be able to cover, you know, I think we're going to be covering AI art pretty often, just because we're going to keep track of it. Um, we are um, the, you know, I think that, you know, looking at how we might use it as stock photography, looking at how we might use it as inspirational, uh, you know, stuff, brainstorming. As I said, I think that those are definitely subjects we want to keep covering. I'll go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and for things like uh, Mid Journey or Dali, as how to craft the text prompt, you know, what, how detailed to get it, how to separate it, if there's any type of uh, technical arrangement of your text and the text prompt that uh, causes it to do certain things and combine certain things and come up with certain looks. So that might be a very handy a guide or a, a tutorial in, in how to craft a good text prompt for these text to art generators. Yeah, there, there's, I, I was listening to an MIT thing yesterday that were, over the weekend that was talking about, um, they're calling it prompt engineering. <laughs> like how do you prompt engineering? Now, I like, to, I prefer to diffusionist. Diffusionist is easier to say, which is the important thing here. Um, so yeah, go ahead, Rick. I like promptographer myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Promptographer. That's cute. <laughs> like that. Um, uh, next question. Next question is from David Brady in New York, New York. Vector synthesis. I've, um, Brought this to John Preto and Alex's attention. There's an authority in the space, Derek Holzer, who would be an awesome second hour guest. Yes. I'd <laughs> like to talk to him. We'd love to have him on. I, I think that vector synthesis is is uh is really cool. So um uh, yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, this is great. He sent Alex and I both this. I've got my scope working. You can see it. I've got a lot of noise on the line, so I had to order a cable because that that big band is all noise on the wire because I got just two pieces of pickup wire running into the scope. So I look forward to implementing this thing and, and getting it working on the scope over here. Good, Mitchell. Does that mean we all have to have oscilloscopes now behind us yeah. so that we can do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's going to be required. You're going to have to have a good audio, good lighting, good camera, and an oscilloscope. <laughs> Next question. Next question from John Foltz in Ceilings Grove, Pennsylvania. Notice some folks are using Keynote for video animations. I've tried it with decent results. It's not After Effects, but it can be fast. Perhaps it's worth digging into that use case. Yeah, I think that we could definitely, whether it's PowerPoint or Keynote, um, I think a lot of people, I've done things where I've done prep work for doing something that we're going to do in animation in After Effects or motion or whatever. And then the client goes, well, that looks great. Let's, do, let's use that. And I'm like, no, it'll get better <laughs> if we use other tools. But there are so many animation tools that are built into Keynote and to PowerPoint. I think we've done some stuff in the education hours on that, but I think we could move it into the into a Tuesday and talk about how to build something simple inside a Keynote, I think would be definitely, and, and inside a PowerPoint if we have an expert to do that. And that could be another one of those, uh, um, a you know, one of those Rosetta Stones, like here's how you do it in Keynote, here's how you do it in PowerPoint, here's how you do it in Canva, you know, those types of things. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, you just said it. I think the ecosystem should be explored, the ecosystem of Blackmagic and Apple and Adobe and any other company, uh, they all have something to offer. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. 
Yeah, uh, Rosetta Stone is a great idea. For those of us who are, are really good and really fast at automating Photoshop, um, for those that don't know, like going a little bit deeper in Keynote, Keynote is still my go-to. And I've, yeah, just like you, Alex, I've, I've, I've been told like, no, 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 leave it there. Like, okay, right. you got it. And show yeah. the parallel would be great. Yeah. Um, next question. Rick Markley and Barbaroo, Barba Boo, um, has anyone experimented with LiDAR video apps like Record 3D? Rick, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Uh, sure, I can actually uh, demo a little bit for you too. Um, it's basically, it's something I, I started using with Looking Glass and it's pairing the LiDAR with the video camera and you can record. So let me kind of switch over and give a little demo here. Uh, I shot this, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but I'll try. All right. Um, all right. So this is shot with the LiDAR and the video camera. So when I look around, you can kind of see the space changing, but I can also then change the perspective of this and, you know, kind of move around. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting way of pine, uh, pairing the LiDAR with video. Be. I mean, I, I definitely think that we're going to be talking about LiDAR relatively often in for the second hours. <laughs> no, it's LIDAR and photogrammetry and capturing those things, I think is definitely going to be something that um, that we do. So yeah, so I think uh, getting the folks on from Record 3D to talk about it, I think would be a great second hour. Um, and I think that um, finding other people that are doing it, I'm, I've been thinking about getting Polycam on and getting, you know, other folks that are doing some of this work on to talk about the, you know, what the challenges are, what it's good at, but making sure that we, we get to see that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next great. question. Next question. Next question in from Sky Gleason in Seattle, Washington. I'm told colors have emotional impact on humans. Can we have someone talk about what are the different emotional effects in a visual experience? Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, I, I feel like a colorist is is the right person to talk about this. I, anytime, for example, in a movie it's hot, you'll notice that there's a little bit of like, you know, a, like an orange or a, a yellow push. Um, little stuff like that, I'm sure there are many others, but that makes all the difference. Next question. Next question from Rick Markley in Baraboo. Uh, is anybody else playing NERFs? I'm not sure if I got Nerfs. that right. Nerfs. Nerfs. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Uh, Sorry, go. I ran across a, uh, a YouTube video from the Corridor Crew, which is a graphics-based uh, 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 YouTube generator uh, group and they did a whole uh, a segment on using nerfs to generate 3d graphics and it was quite interesting so it might be possible to get somebody from uh, corridor crew in la uh, in to talk about it and uh, what uh, changes it's making in rendering out there for 3d graphics are there specific rick are there specific uh, companies or or solutions that you're looking at i know that polycam is adding nerf uh, out you know nerf management into the into what it's doing. Um, I'm currently using a, a Luma app and I'll, I'll kind of switch over here. So one of the great things about Luma or, or NERFs, uh, it's it's capturing the light fields so you can get things that are like reflective. Like this guitar would have been really hard to shoot as photogrammetry, but you know, the, the shiny objects and the glossy objects turn out really well since it's capturing the light fields instead of doing the, the math to calculate between the different camera angles. Right. Right. Yeah, go back. Can somebody help me with my ignorance? I'm not familiar with the term. I was I tried to look it up and all I got was soft, fluffy toys to shoot at people. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I, I always wonder um, uh, whether, you know, one of the things that um, uh, that I that I that I always wonder here is is if Hasbro or whatever, whoever makes that is uh if, if, they're, if they're upset about the fact that they that, that someone has uh usurped their thing because when we talk about nerfs all we're talking about is neural uh radiance fields and so that's that's what nerf uh, uh stands for i believe um and uh but but it, it's a it's a different way of capturing you know basically building those 3d scenes i don't know if mark if rick wants to explain that a little bit more so yeah it's capturing uh it's capturing uh the, the light bouncing in the in the scene versus photogrammetry which is using the different angles uh, and kind of calculating the math between the angles so um like with photogrammetry like i was mentioning it's really hard to capture glass or shiny objects or or you know something that's really glossy whereas this is actually seeing how the light is reflected around the scene and and using those calculations to build this model 
That took yeah, care so, of it. As soon as I looked up neural radiance fields, everything became obvious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So get there from Nerf, and and it's considered the you know the big future for a lot of this stuff. And so um, I will definitely get some folks on to talk about uh, Nerf um, because I think it's it's an important thing to to do, and they won't be from Hasbro. I promise. Uh, <laughs> next question. Next question from Brandon Buttram in Indianapolis, and is so in his, Indiana. Sorry, panelist show and tell maybe a focus on showing the evolution of their skills and tools over time. Go, ahead, Jason. I'm I'm sure that uh, I'm not the only panelist who would love to show off th their skills. Um, I can't talk about all my projects, but you know some of them would be interesting. I think uh, constraining it to a specific vertical would be would be much more useful and, you know, see what we each have, uh, you know, along some line. Next question. John Snyder, Reno, Nevada, asking, topic idea, an hour focused on Bezier curves. How do they work? How to manipulate them? And whatever. I know who to bring on for that. And so um, Freya Homer. Freya Homer is who we need to bring on to talk about Bezier curves. Um, she built the most amazing... Uh, one hour on cur Bezier curves that I've ever seen. I and watched so, that. It was mesmerizing. Mesmerizing. like mesmerizing. And, uh, So Freya Homer is the one we want to try to bring on. And I, she's on my list of targets of people to bring on. So um, so anyway, so I, I would highly, I, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. But um, I think that'd be great. Uh, next question. Scott Mueller in Germantown, New York, asking, I tend to build graphics for online events right in vMix. What are you using for graphics for online events versus post-production graphics? Yeah, I think that there's a whole bunch of verticals that we could cover here as as subjects, um, you know, because because I definitely building graphics for post-production is very different than building those graphics for live production. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I just think that the tools have con are continually evolving. I've been surprised at how much I've done inside Final Cut only because its graphic engine is a subset of the code right. in Motion. Motion is too complicated for me to spend too much right. time in because it's too deep. But we're seeing this over and over, which is subsets of the tools in complex programs being put in and popularized in simpler programs. I think it's a great thing to talk about just generally overall. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. If you could find somebody from VizRT to come in to, to deal with uh, live live video graphics that are used in sports packages and so or on, Ross. live television, or Ross, yeah. We, we know people at Ross. VizRT. <laughs> so, Ross. So, so it'd yeah, be good to bring in to talk about. I'd love to bring in, uh, once the football season slows down a little bit, I'd love to bring in some folks. to. We've had that in the past. Uh, we've talked to some folks about that. Um, but really talk about how, how the AR kind of solutions are, are being built there. Um, I think would be really, really fun um, to to put in what the challenges are. So in, it, it's not, you know, I think that also inserting real-time graphics um, into a 3D scene, I think is going to be an interesting puzzle to to figure out as well. But I think that even just a very basic how to do lower thirds and graphics in your ATEM would probably be a good second hour and vMix and, you know, other things. But, but you know, I think we could focus on some of those if we have the right experts to do that. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, modeling and sculpting in Blender. I go ahead, Jason. I, I would start, um, Alex, what was the name of the app that um, it was a while ago you were showing us? You start with like a lump of clay, you know, and it's this addition and, and removal app. Um, you know what I'm talking about? I do. Uh, I just don't have it on the top of my head. Um, but the, uh, but you know, a lot of these apps have come a long way. Um you know, to, to, to producing those one, things. One, two, so, 3D make, something like that. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of them out there. And, uh, um, but I think that, you know, talking about different types of tools, whether it's ZBrush, you know, is, is one that is. ZBrush. Um, yeah, so ZBrush also, um, but there's a lot of tools like that sculpting. I think that the basics of, of modeling, there is probably a, a first, second hour that's just comparing and contrasting different types of modeling. So you have sculpting, you have sub D surfaces, you have booling and, you know, more structured lofting. These are all different tools and maybe even there could be a little bit of a, this is how you use them. Could be a whole second hour, why you use one over the other. But then there's a whole, like how to model something would be probably useful as well. Go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Our very own Chris Fritchie would be good for that. He's an excellent modeler. And uh, also just to point out that uh, modeling and sculpting is not is a subset of Blender as it is with Cinema 4D. There are other standalone modeling programs that are specific to doing those tasks. There you go, Jason. 
Well, yeah, and just as a follow-up, um, similar to, to my feeling on the cloud and having a shared vocabulary, of course, that the um, the power of any discipline starts with its vocabulary. So, you know, to, to just go in and explain, you know, what is a voxel? Um, you know, how is it different than a pixel? Stuff like that, I think, might be useful. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, something that's really uh, changed how I model is uh, virtual reality. Modeling in VR has really taken it off, you know, the 2D screen and into the 3D world. It really changes how I've viewed modeling and, and just changes how I think spatially. It's it's a really interesting, um, I don't know how we could demonstrate that over, you know, Zoom, but, um, you know, I think it's a really interesting um, method for sculpting these days. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Courtney. And no uh, discussion of blender would be complete without frog in a blender, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the um by the way, like we we did videos of Medium. You know, Medium was one of the VR is one of the I think Adobe bought it from Oculus or whatever, but you could draw in in 3D. And what we had to do is we sunk the camera, you know, up. We would sync up the camera um with the right focal length and the right position of the artist, and we just wouldn't move that camera. And it just looked like the artist was sitting, you looked like you were watching a 2D of the of the artist just drawing in 3D, which was kind of cool. So that's, and they're in front of green screen. So, and you can put Oculus trackers on them and then you can do handheld and move around as well. And so it's, there's a couple different ways to do that. Next question. John Fultz in Sealings Grove, Pennsylvania. How about a discussion of using and adapting templates such as videohive.net and other stock assets? Good, Bill. I'd give a plus one to that. I'm surprised at how many times I go in and buy maybe a $49 template from Motion VFX just because I want to go into the code of that and break out this one effect and bring it into something I need to get done on a deadline. And boy, it saved me hours of times in terms of creating things myself. So I think that's a really, really useful topic. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I'm with Bill, like Pond5 and others. Uh, I, it's a starting point a lot of times when I need to do a, a very detailed uh, After Effects animation. It's a it's a good thing to be able to uh, to find the whole the whole system of finding a template and how to search for it and what would be uh, a good one to use. Yeah, bringing that, some of them. Yeah, bringing some of those those folks on would be good. I mean, that would be a, Pond5 might be a little hard, but but for some of these other ones that that are kind of more. Uh, customized, you know, like I think Motion VFX. I don't know. How, I don't know how we haven't brought them on. I know Simon and Motion VFX, I know. VFX I, pretty I, well. I didn't with Simon. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, I don't. That's why I don't know why I haven't brought him on. Yeah, yeah. No, that's so, great. He's yeah, fabulous. So, yeah, he's great. So we'll we'll see if we can, we can get them on. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael suggesting uh, Unreal Engine Five along with Unity. Yeah, I mean, I think that we will definitely be talking about things that are related to AR and VR, and probably at least once a month. Um, and, uh, and so I think that Unreal Engine 5 and understanding what nanites are and doing all the, you know, putting things into it, I think also possibly trying to, over time, mash the two of them, to, you know, like what works in Unreal 5, this gets back into that Rosetta, but how do we do that in Unity? I think a lot of us are still trying to figure out what's going to happen next, you know, as far as wh who, who does Apple partner with and how do they, um, push that because that's going to create a bit of a, uh, uh, a bit of a surge um, sometime this year, most likely. Next question. Sky Gleason, Seattle, Washington. His suggestion is, uh, could we have a 2HR on graphic styles in the context of why some work and some do not work? I Go ahead, uh, Jason. I love this idea. Um, for example, a lot of what you're taught in business school is not how to be successful, but what not to do. And in this case, you know, it's not the how it fails, it's why it fails and, you know, what's wrong with it to give you just kind of like a bumper bowling approach to, you know, don't mix serif and sans serif unless or of course, you know, that kind of thing I think makes a lot of sense. You go ahead, Courtney. Besides design used in advertising, let's say I'd be interested also in a second hour on uh, graphics design for user interface, UI, whether mm -hmm. skeuomorphism works or layout layout of controls and so on graphically uh, would be interesting second hour. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think generally design is something that we don't spend enough time on. Go ahead, John. I have Midjourney doing my UIs right now and they're coming out pretty good. <laughs> Oh no! I actually, I, I had my first. I, I'm, I had to file this big report, and it needed a lot of images. And I had one image that I just couldn't quite find a stock photography, so I just typed it into Mid Journey. I was like, "No, oh, that'll work." Put it in there. So you know, like it just it was just an example for a for a chapter marker, you know. And it was, I was like, "Oh, it's kind of fun." So yeah. Next question. Next question in from Deborah Woodfork in Washington D.C. Topic: Digital Asset Management Systems. Yes. 
Yeah, I think um, working with, you know, figuring those things out, there's some pretty large ones. Um, there are, uh, and there's, you know, some, I'd like, I'd love to bring the folks in. We've, we had some experience with Blackbird, which we thought was really interesting. It's probably not something that all of us can afford <laughs> anytime soon, but, um, but it's a really powerful one, but there's lots of smaller ones and larger ones. And, and we look, there's a lot of different business models related to it. Go ahead, Bill. Well, and expand that out a little bit to digital asset management practices. What are the things that everybody should know as they start to build these larger and larger digital libraries about things like naming conventions and other things that just help you keep organized yeah. uh, as you migrate toward a, a full-fledged dam? And go ahead, uh, uh, Jason. Well, yeah, and the term comes from um, from Peter Krogh's book, um, which is now in its third revision called The Dam Book. Um, I don't know, maybe we could reach out to him. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Brody Hefner from New York City. Tech and workflows used for dig digitization, digitization, Mitch, of 2D and 3D cultural heritage objects by museums, libraries, and archives. Yeah, there's a lot going on right now in that area. Um, I'd love to bring, we'll see if we can find someone from the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian is probably doing the most of it, that of any company. They put, all, they put it all on the web. If you do a... a, a, a search for a Smithsonian 3D object, you will see hundreds and hundreds of objects that they are doing a very high quality um, it's photogrammetry actually uh, for. It'd be fun to have them on. Um, I've done a little bit at locations um, and uh, so it'd be, it'd be fun to talk about those things as well. So yeah, I think that that'd be a great subject. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael asking touch designer and other real-time graphics and performance environments. Yeah, I think that we haven't done enough of that. Um, we've had some second hours for Isadora. Um, I think that you know, bringing some folks on from from Universe as well as Touch Designer, as well as you know, a couple different um, uh, different app applications there that we should keep our eye on. And I think bringing them on and, and having them show us those things would make a lot of difference. Uh, next question. Uh, it's for me. I'm thinking typography. I just I bought a book. Where is it? I literally bought the book because I was like, the book is so good. I was like, we should bring this author on. And so, you know, it was, but it was about um, type design. So actually not just topography, but it literally how they build the types in the software that's used and how that gets created. There's a lot of, a lot of tools there that are really interesting. Um, there's a, there is a, uh, it's the builder's bookstore in, in Berkeley in the four, on fourth street. And I go, that's, I go probably once a month there and buy something and there's just this section on design and topography and other things that I that I'm obsessed with. So I think that'd be a lot of fun. I go ahead, Bill. Yeah, a lot of the transition, the traditions of typography come from the print world because it's been around for so long. But I find there's a lot of difficulty people have when migrating their skills from typography and print onto these new electronic rasters they have to work with. And they don't have the resolution. They don't have the fine detail that that makes typography typography. Which so I'd be interested in having somebody come in and talk about um, how, what it's like to design for multiple mediums and what are the differences. What's funny is I can always tell when a print designer does lower thirds because they look way better. <laughs> like when a print designer does lower thirds, you know, they, they pay attention to a lot of things that, that video designers don't pay attention to. And it just feels more solid. Like when the lower third comes out, there's something about it because they've, they've kerned everything and they've made it all work and they, they've done everything that needed to be done. And so when print, print designers building lower thirds or on-air graphics, I find tend to look way better than video designers because they actually use the tools that are sitting inside the app. And so I think that talking to them about that would be fun. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, you know, the little things about, um, you know, taking art and adapting it to a digital um, to a digital frontier, you know, and the anti-aliasing, how to smooth things mm -hmm. perfectly, um, it, it does make all the difference. And, you know, mm -hmm. someone who could speak authoritatively about about how to adapt that would be excellent. And, and even approaches to things like kerning, you know, and spacing and process and all the things that uh, CNN ignores. Not that I'm bitter. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I could see a second hour on papyrus and the proper use. <laughs> I, I know God. what you did. I know what you did. All right, next question. Next question from Tom Ferguson. I had a delayed reaction. Sorry. Uh, Tom is from Phoenix, <laughs> Arizona. My, my, my reference sunk in for Mitchell there. For How about graphics for a system documentation purpose? Sorry, Tom. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Tom. Well, we talk about rack design, flow diagrams, block diagrams, wiring diagrams. How often do we really document spaghetti that we patch together here? Yeah. Yeah, and, and how we do it and what what apps you use. I know a lot of people use HTR, H2R graphics. Um, I, 
Uh, I still use OmniGraffle just because I've been using it since version one. <laughs> so, so it's so, um, but there's obviously the large drawings are all done in CAD. So it just all depends. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. As a writer of several technical documents for my own software, I can tell you no one reads the documentation. <laughs> uh, next question. Next one in from Juan C. Robles in Mexico City, Mexico. How about planning management for a graphics project? I think it'd be great. You know, so really talking about the, the process of how you plan the, the graphics and how you manage it and what, what's necessary and what are the steps, I think would be a great, a great process there. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Uh, it's for me, uh, HDRI photography. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that I think uh, I, I think that'd make a great second hour. Uh, I don't see it as often. Uh, it's used a lot in in uh, real estate because you have these houses that have you know an interior and windows and everything else, and so you know pulling those together. It, it sometimes has a little bit of a. I guess the, one of the things is how to do it with it. As when we first got into it, everyone was doing it. I was doing it. Everyone was doing it, and a lot of us kind of backed away because it had this kind of unreal look that became out of fashion. <laughs> so, so there was, so it hasn't been as much, uh, done with it as much as just shooting, um, and then, and then stretching it back out again. Yeah. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah. I think H, um, I, I think real estate is precisely how we don't want our images to look. They get smooth <laughs> to death. It's awful. Uh, zoom in the next time you look at a real estate photo and look at an outlet. You, you, you'll see just how, how manipulated it is. Go ahead, Rick. You know, I think it's a, a spherical HDRIs like uh, sky domes and things like that, uh, sky boxes. I think those would be something good to cover. I think they're pretty beneficial in, in 3D and, and Unreal Engine and even in all that. Yeah, and there's been great ones. It's I've gotten to watch this. Um, I start. I did my first spherical, not HDR, but the first spherical images in the early 90s. And, um, you know, where we took a bunch of st slides and then we put them through this Nikon scanner and then we wrote scripts to put them into QuickTime VR. And, and that, that was how we started doing this. And we've been doing it now. I said, I have a theta with an app that just does nine exposures. <laughs> you know, like if I'm trying to get a light probe and, and it's just, it's come a long way. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I did a uh, open to a news open to a TV station in Baltimore and going in and shooting the studio with the HDR, with the sphere and everything, and then bringing it back in as an environment uh, map uh, that whole aspect of mapping it with environments just makes things look so much more realistic in 3D. Uh, next question. Next question from Talalik Lopez Waterman in Seattle, Washington. Projection mapping. Uh, John. I'm part of a group on Facebook that's a projection map mapping group, and some of the stuff that the guys are doing in there is spectacular. I'm happy to share my knowledge with Resolume for projection mapping. I've done my house for Christmas and, and Halloween since 2016. So happy to share that info. I go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I think uh, I, I refer to it commonly as spatial augmented reality now. Um, but the things that have been happening with uh, that have been incredible, like Meow Wolf, um, some of like their, their immersive rooms there. Um, I've been doing uh, some projection mapping with a couple of groups. I did a Pink Floyd project where we recreated the wall and projection mapped onto a wall being built brick by brick. It was a lot of fun, but um, yeah, I think projection mapping, and especially in the sense of the spatial augmented reality, uh, it, it's it's really taking a grasp, and I think there's a big future for it. So definitely love to talk more about that. Yeah, I think it'd be a fun project to, to kind of play with. I know that I went started down the path of of getting ready for Halloween and Christmas and I started working on what I was going to do and some of it was from inspired from what John was doing but I was like I so I scanned the front of my house <laughs> I did a lidar scan up the front of my house and then started projection mapping from Cinema 4D so using the the tools to projection map and see what is this going to look like from different angles you know from from where I'm projecting and then but the part that I'm still working on right now is syncing that focal length back up to the projector, you know, so that I know what projector is going to be there and how it's going to project so that I can previs the whole thing and know that it's all going to work before I start, you know, building it out and having things run around. And so it's, it's a, it's an interesting, interesting puzzle. And what makes it more interesting is I, of course, and this is why it didn't get done this year because I was really busy as two, is I wanted to do three projectors and then mat them <laughs> so that they were so things would happen and you'd be able to see them from different directions and um i made it too complicated and didn't get done this year but now i have all year to work on it <laughs> go ahead jason 
Well, yeah, and, and maybe even to start with a brief history. I mean, uh, most people don't know that that projection mapping is as old on screen as you know Charlie Chaplin. I mean, this is some really old stuff that you know has been adapted and 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 messed with over time. So neat yeah. stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. So so I think that projection mapping would be great, and it'd be great to bring on folks like Tlaloc. Um, there's there's I find that projection mapping. I don't know if it's just where I've seen it is super popular in Europe. Like it is, I feel like I, you know, I, we were working with a company that helped us do a production in Berlin. And then I went to their offices and they were showing me in every single event they did. Maybe that's just what they specialize in, but every event had this super complex projection mapping across buildings. And it was just, and I was, I, yeah, it's interesting. Next question. Courtney Gooden in Hollywood, California, ask, uh, how about a second hour on volumetric video capture and utilization in AR and VR? Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I actually did one of those, I think, um, in an early office hours. I was like pre-recording days. I don't know if you still got that somewhere. I'd love to see that someday, but absolutely. And I, I feel um, nerfs, I think, are really um, going to possibly uh, play heavily into that because of their ability to capture the light fields versus, um, you know, just the pure math-based recalculations with um, volumetrics. Yeah, and I think... I'm. I think that there's a big space that Microsoft has down in LA that that is that does video video volumetric capture, which is is quite a um, pretty complicated thing. Yeah, I got Courtney. Yeah, I've worked on a, a number of them, and it's very difficult to so running a teleprompter. It's very difficult to run a teleprompter in a volumetric video capture stage because it's an entire green sphere, and you have to make it so it can't be seen. Uh, but it, it was really tricky. But all the, all the, unfortunately, all the uh, volumetric capture companies that I worked for here in LA have gone under. So I'm not sure if it's still a viable uh, source, but I'm sure there must it, be some out there. It definitely was a. I know that it's been so far the computational. It's days and days of of computation for the level that they were doing. They were doing basically film level computation or TV level, at least, um, you know, computation where you could move around an entire thing, but it was a lot of processing. I mean, they were, I don't know how many cameras they were using. It was, but it was, it took a while. You know, good, Rick. Uh, Christina Heller from Metastage would probably be a great second hour uh, to bring in. She's still going really strong with her, that's, her company. I, I wasn't going to call her out, but that's, that's who I'm probably going to try to bring in is Christina. Yeah. So that's <laughs> so anyway, next question. Next question for Marty Atias in Maryland. Uh, I recently found a, uh, he's got a list there to where it goes to, a nodal-based graphics generator. What are the potential uses for video production? Yeah, go ahead, Bill. This looked really interesting. I just took a look at it over the course of the show here, and it looks like it's a process for connecting visually kind of um, modifiers that end up generating random patterns and less than random patterns into backgrounds. I could see this as being something that somebody who wanted a, a lower third over some kind of a beautiful moving thing could really get some interesting results out of it. It looks really fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And I think that bringing, uh, bringing a lot of different ones, whether it's Isadora or cables or other things back in to, to show how these things can be generated, I think would be useful. Next question. Brody Hefner, New York City, asking, how about a presentation on the Triple IF, the International Image Interoperability Framework, open standards used by image repositories for delivering digital objects at scale. It's widely used for books, maps, and multi-page illustrated documents. Yes, we just need an expert on that. It'd be great to have someone come in and talk about that. Um, you know, so someone from the organization, uh, someone that, that manages it or people that use it a lot, it'd be great to have. Those are the kind of things that I think are a great second hour. Are we going to use it immediately every day? No. But does it increase our overall wisdom and understanding of the industry? Yes. And so I think that having a handful of those every quarter makes, makes a big difference. So yeah, let's uh, keep looking at that. Uh, next question. Talalik Lopez Waterman in Seattle currently. CAD, AutoCAD, Vectorworks, SketchUp? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, all of these. I feel like, you know, there are certain things that tend to fall outside of the norm uh, when it comes to your standard AV production that that kind of need a constant update and reminder about, like, just how useful and relevant they can be, at least as far as, you know, a cross-platform approach can get to any sort of 3D anything. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, this would be wonderful, interesting for creating uh, 3D objects for 3D printing, you know, a CAD CAD programs or free yep. free programs that help you generate uh, 3D objects for printing. 
I think, yeah, I think there's a couple of divergent subjects. One is we'd probably be willing, we'd be interested in bringing people in from each one of these things, whether it's Vectorworks or AutoCAD or, or uh, SketchUp, as well as, you know, um, you know, one of the things I'm starting to dig into more and I'm getting a new PC <laughs> to do is, is recap, um, you know, so, to grab stuff from, from LiDAR and then putting them back in. And so, you know, really talking through, you know, some of the folks, some of the stuff that's there. Um, and then I do think that a step-by-step, -step, as Courtney said, of, of like, here's the thing that we did um, is, you know, we, we maybe, maybe even we digitized this with, you know, we scanned something like what I'm working on right now. I just got a new piece of the puzzle. This is my little platform that I that is my new piece of the puzzle of scanning objects that I want to then build 3D models around. So I have my uh, mini extreme, uh, a screen, a couple other things that I want to put in and I want to print something that's going to hold all of them the way I want them. And then I'll talk to Chris about making it out of wood, <laughs> but I'm going to prototype it with a printer. Um, and uh, and but how do I go about digitizing that and then how do I use that in a 3D app to build something and then how do I print it? Or, or, and that could be one example. It could, there'd be a lot of other ones. That, Alex, Alex what's the cheese plate for? Is that just your your cheese plate for scale in the corner or something? No, so I need, the cheese plate is because I need to have the smallest platform but stable that I can that is going to sit on, um, so I'm gonna piece of, put a little piece of rubber over top of it so that I can put it on a, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be using a, a tri, tri triad orbit um so that the the the, tri, the the tripod is down below and then this will screw in on top of the triad orbit and then i'm going to put a little piece of rubber there and it's just so that i can have it up high so that i can take all the pictures that i need to but it has to be really small uh, i keep on using bigger things or things that aren't quite working and i've decided that i just was going to invest 11 dollars in this small rig <laughs> you know cheese plate yeah go ahead rick you know, um, I, I'm really interested in what people are using uh, with AI to generate 3D uh, objects now. Like uh, NVIDIA has been demoing their single image to 3D. Um, and, you know, there's some other AIs that are starting to generate some 3D. I, I think I mentioned like the the using um, creating depth maps from some AI images and things like that. But I see there's a lot of potential. Um, I even, I don't know if anybody's heard of this, but there's a app or a web page called Monster Mash where you can take I take my kids 2D drawings and you can pull them into Monster Mash and it'll like inflate them and turn them into 3D objects so you can animate the kids' drawings and stuff. Oh, but that's great. Yeah, there's some really cool stuff out there. I think there's a lot of potential with AI and 3D generation as well. Yeah, I've been tracking some artists that are using Scenario GG, Scenario.gg, which is you, uh, it'll build a whole bunch of uh, game characters for you. <laughs> like, so you, you put some of the stuff in and then it builds them, them all out. And I And what's interesting is that Blender is now um, they are partnering to start having some of the 3D generation being done. Potentially, you'll be able to do it in the app. Like, give me this object in the 3D app and it'll just appear, you know, as opposed to trying to figure out what to do with it or how to do it. And so I, I, we're going to be tracking, I mean, we in this field, we will be tracking AI all year because uh, we have to keep, we have to pay attention to it. You, 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 I know that some people get stressed about it, but it's coming fast, you know, so it's, it, 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 you know, we need to make sure that we're paying attention to what's actually happening. Next question. John Snyder, Reno, Nevada, asking with a topic idea, reviewing Super Bowl graphics. Yeah, if we can, we'll definitely look at some of these larger events and, and prepare to look at those graphics and talk about them because the Super Bowl is usually where a lot gets done, you know, and, and planned. And so, um, so I think that we are going to come back to, re it's been a couple of years now, I think, since the last time we reviewed things like super sources and lower thirds and those fashions go in and out. So we'll probably start doing more of those again, um, you know, to review those. And so, but I think reviewing specific ones that we know people spent a lot of money on them, uh, is probably a good idea as well. Uh, next question. Ike Potter in Hanover, Germany asking, follow up on typography. I'm wondering if it makes sense to use the latex package for lower third or text creation in media. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, so I took a look at this too. This is a high-end typesetting system for people who are doing a lot of research papers and uh, technical and scientific documents. Uh, it, it's interesting. It was not on my radar. And, you know, I've been surprised at how specific in, in niche industries the rules are for all sorts of things about, it's kind of like script writing. If you don't write in the standard Hollywood thing, they won't even look at your work. And I think as more and more subjects branch out and there's more and more online communication, we're all going to have to understand a little bit more about how to present things for niche audiences so that we look like we're 
um, at least understand what they expect, that's going to affect typesetting, I think, over the course of the next few years. Go, Jason. Yeah, I've used latex extensively in in, um, in neurological research papers that I've, I've had to be a part of. And um, it's it's neat stuff. It's very useful. And it had never occurred to me to present it as part of broadcast graphics. I love it. Well, there's there's a good start. <laughs> so I think we've got a lot of great ideas uh, of the kind of things that we want to cover uh, on this day. And um, if you're into computer graphics, our, our, our request is you think about coming onto the panel. So just once a week, if you're if you're doing computer graphics like Rick and Nick and many other people here, of um, Mitch and doing 2D and 3D and and um, and all these other things, we're going to be covering all of those that that process. And the more good experts we can get in the morning uh, to answer people's questions, we want it to be a great resource for both hours um, to be the, the place you ask those kinds of questions. So we'd like to invite you to do that. Um, that'd be great. And uh, but we should it should be a fun a fun set of Tuesdays uh, that we fill with a lot of this stuff. So so stay tuned for that. All right. Thanks so much to the uh, producers who um, did a great job, great brainstorming, um, and uh, and just lots of great ideas. And so we're we're, we're taking those down and we're going to think through them, figure out how to structure them. Uh, thanks to the panel, of course. We can't do this without you. It was a great um, great panel this morning. Uh, lots of great great answers, great discussions, and uh, thanks to the incredible crew on the back end that uh, gets all this stuff done. You're going to see a bunch of credits here in a second, and that's it's small small uh, village that it takes to put this together. So thanks for all your hard work. All right, let's go ahead and jump into After Hours. And a reminder that Mac break, Mac break is coming. So, Mac break coming, warning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 90,000 miles, 144,000 kilometers, 815 million bananas for scale. That's a lot of minions. So many bananas. So many bananas. I wonder I wonder how we scale a banana. How many bananas is a minion? Probably four, I think. Gonna go with three and a half, yeah. I think we I think we ought to think about how many minions it is. And then maybe we can make graphics about minions. Latex come in bunches like Join. bananas. Uh, mid, mid journey is exceptional at rendering minions. Just in case you're wondering. Lots of examples.